Certain psychological experiments have pushed the boundaries of ethics, raising serious concerns about the treatment of human subjects in scientific research. In this video, we'll delve into some of the most disturbing psychological experiments ever conducted and explore the psychological, social, and ethical implications of these studies. From the infamous monster study to the strange sex raft experiment, we'll be examining the shocking outcomes and the lessons that we can learn from each of them. So are you ready to dive into the darker side of psychology? In case you've missed it, this is the fifth part of the psychological experiment iceberg. If you haven't checked out the other ones, I'll try to put up a little card right here. Um, yeah, other than that, we're just going to jump right on into it. So appreciate you watching. Starting off part five is the monster study. The monster study was conducted by Dr. Wendell Johnson, who was a speech pathologist, to learn about why children developed the stutter. Johnson developed the monster study to see if stuttering was a result of a learned behavior or biology. However, there were many ethical problems with this study. Dr. Johnson conducted the monster study back in 1936 at the University of Iowa, and ethics were not prioritized as they are now in psychology and other scientific experiments. And yeah, basically, if they tried to do this experiment today, they probably would have been stopped before they even tried, because um, you'll end up seeing why. Johnson chose 22 orphans as participants for the monster study. Some of the orphans had a stutter, and it's not uncommon for young children to have a stutter and then naturally just get over it as they age. And some of these orphans didn't even have a stutter to begin with. The orphans were split up into two groups with the stutterers and non-stutterers in both groups. One of these groups were labeled as normal speakers, and the others were labeled as stutterers. Throughout the course of the experiment, the children were treated as such, basically. Both of the groups had both stutterers and non-stutterers, but one whole group was just labeled stutterers and the other one were just uh, labeled normal speaking. And they were just treated like this, regardless if they were studying, uh, studying stuttering or if they were just speaking normal. This whole thing's got me stuttering now, dude, damn. Johnson's team met with the children every few weeks for five months to evaluate their speech. Children in the normal group were praised for their ability to speak well, even if they were actually stuttering. Stuttering, dude, I've, oh my God, this is bad. Or if they had problems speaking. So either way, even if they were stuttering like I'm doing in this video, um, or if they just had problems speaking, they were still praised as long as they were in the normal speaking group. While children in the stuttering group were told that they spoke poorly. Either way, even if they were stuttering or if they were speaking, you know, well and without a stutter, they were still told that basically they were speaking poorly and they were told that you must try to stop yourself immediately. Don't ever speak unless you can do it right. This is what the doctors are telling them. The children who were labeled normal weren't affected much by the researchers praise. They only saw improvement in one child. However, children in the stuttering group fared a lot worse. Remember that most of these children didn't even actually have a stutter. They were just told that they had a stutter. And of the six children that were falsely chastised for their speech, five ended up developing speech problems later in life. And reports show that these children became withdrawn and some stopped speaking altogether. These children were as young as five years old at the time too. So you gotta think this is kindergartners, first graders. I'm not sure what age around the globe people end up going to kindergarten, first grade, but it's around that age. And they're just being absolutely yelled at, you know what I mean, chastised exactly. Like basically degraded for speaking well, even if, or speaking with a stutter, even if they actually didn't have a stutter to the point where five of the six kids that didn't have a stutter ended up developing some sort of speech problem. The study was created with good intentions. Johnson and his colleagues at the University of Iowa frequently conducted studies on themselves and willing adult subjects in the name of finding a cure for stuttering. But other colleagues worried that the use of orphans was crossing the line. And I agree. Johnson wasn't the only person conducting studies on marginalized groups in the name of science. In fact, the Nazis were doing the same thing over in Germany. So the results of the study were actually never published. And you gotta think, basically, at the time, Exactly. Who's who's also doing some messed up stuff at this time? Hitler and the Nazis. So, you know what I mean? Like, do you really want to be getting compared to this? I don't know. Personally, no, not at all. But this guy clearly was like, dude, listen, I'm working on these orphans regardless. So I don't know, man. I don't think I don't think Johnson's a good guy at all. So what was the impact of the monster study? Even in the 1930s, the monster study was crossing lines. Using orphans as tough subjects is one thing, but using minors in a study without their consent is another. Even the staff at the orphanage were unaware of what was really going on. This left many of the stutterers with unresolved psychological trauma, basically that persisted throughout their lives. Researchers knew that this was a possibility. One member of Johnson's team wrote that, I believe that in time they will recover, but we certainly made a definite impression on them. And man, they were not wrong. Like they literally messed these kids up for life. I mean, you took people that were speaking well at four and five, you know what I mean? First grade and completely messed them up to the point where they didn't even feel like they wanted to speak at all. 
I don't know, dude. I would consider that ruining them at this point. Like, you know, that probably took years and years to ever get over if they ever did. You know what I mean? So who knows? The sad part was that she was right. The student's schoolwork suffered and one ran away from the orphanage two years later. Later, she said that the study ruined her life, like I was just saying. Subjects didn't know that they were actually part of a study until 60 years after it happened. Only a handful of speech pathology students at the University of Iowa learned about the study after it was published. The information was useful. No one at the time had collected so much data about stuttering and how it developed. But the premise of the study was so horrifying that they nicknamed it the Monster Study. And I think it deserves that name, to be honest. The subjects ended up seeking justice. In the early 2000s, three of the subjects in the stutterer group sued the University of Iowa for emotional distress and fraudulent misrepresentation. The estates of three other stutterers were also included in the lawsuit. The plaintiffs claimed that the impact of the study had a lasting impact. One still hates to talk, another who says that she now has a good life said that she didn't have many friends in the orphanage partly because she was so quiet. And they ended up winning their settlement, which thank god they ended up winning that dude. Like these, these people got their lives ruined, so I mean I'm hoping that they won. Uh, the University of Iowa paid over $1 million to the victims and their estates. Which realistically, for ruining maybe like six people's lives, a um, million dollars, bro, probably does not cover that. Like, let's be real. They didn't even find out that they were part of this for 60 more years. So, I don't know. You think that's worth it? Let me know down below. Up next, the Akali experiment. The Akali was a raft which was used in the Akali expedition or the Akali experiment. It has also been nicknamed the sex raft. The raft had a group of 11 people, five men and six women. It left Las Palmas, Spain on May 12, 1973 and took 101 days to drift across the Atlantic Ocean to reach Cozumel, Mexico and they had a single stopover in Barbados. The experiment was conceived by Mexican anthropologist Santiago Genevieve to investigate interpersonal relationships in condition of limited space and social isolation. Creating a group that would be as explosive as possible was the experiment's aim. He wanted these people to be going at it. He wanted. He wanted some drama on this boat is what he was expecting. I mean, you guys see the nickname of this, the sex raft, like he was expecting some big stuff to happen with this, okay? Most of the men and women participating were married with children, although they took the trip alone. Apart from Genevieve, the crew consisted of a Swedish captain, a Jewish doctor, a Japanese photographer, a Greek cook, an Algerian priest, an American sailor, and an African American woman, an Algerian Arab woman, a Uruguayan anthropologist, and a French scuba diver. So that is the group of people that we're working with. It was a group of 11, 5, and 6. So just so we got that cleared. Apart from that, Genevieve decided to give the most important roles of the boat to two women. Maria Bornstein was the only professional navigator on board and the captain of the ship. Edna Jonas was the only doctor. Decisions that would undoubtedly cause discomfort among the crew. Um, basically, he was expecting these guys to basically be jealous and, you know what I mean, obviously be like, dude, why are you putting these women up? You know what I mean? He was expecting these guys to be sexist right off the rip is what he was basically expecting. In order to refine the analysis, all the members of the group were subjected to clinical tests and psychiatric and graphological examinations. Not exactly sure what graphological uh, examinations are, to be real with you, but we're going with it. Based on my comprehension, the term graphological would pertain to the field of graphology, which involves examining a person's handwriting to identify their character traits. There is no scientific basis to support the practice of graphology, and it is largely viewed as a pseudoscience or a scientific methodology that lacks credibility and can be more likened to palm reading. And thus, Genevieve detailed a profile of each member of the crew and elaborated a prognosis about the social relationships established during the journey. Basically, he was keeping track of everything going on in this entire trip. Once on board, people faced different unusual situations. For instance, they needed to do their needs out in the open. And if you get what I get, you know what I mean? They had to go to the bathroom out in the open in front of everybody, basically like they're in jail or something. Pretty crazy. And also distribute the tasks on board. Interestingly, when each conflict seemed to become more intense, the group managed to solve it by themselves. After a month, Genevieve wrote in his notes that on board the group is developing certain sense of fellowship, liberal and healthy, but quite empty. Uh, that was his exact notes of what he wrote down in his little journal, diary, whatever you want to call it. There was even a time when the crew concluded that Genevieve was their biggest problem, as they had developed strategies to continuously unleash the conflict on the ship. Basically, they were kind of realizing that this dude was creating all their problems and basically just being a pain in the ass for everybody. Everybody else was seeming to get along fine and was able to resolve whatever issues were coming up, except 
they've realized that Genevieve kind of constantly was just bringing up more problems for them. So, you know what I mean? Now they're kind of all like, dude, I'm not messing with this guy at all. And I don't blame them. Now, one big milestone that did happen was when one of the Akali's rubber blades came loose. And despite the danger posed by the sharks that in that part of the ocean, Genevieve intervened to inspect the damage. Suddenly, everyone knew exactly what they had to do. And so they ended up solving the problem pretty quickly. The anthropologist question was then posed in a written form. Are life-threatening situations necessary for the crew to develop team spirit? Basically, his biggest question was, oh, do these people's lives need to be in danger for them to end up coming together as a group? Which... If you're paying attention, it doesn't because they were already kind of getting along and resolving their problems fine. And he just kept on bringing up random problems for them. So I don't know. I think this guy's just like a major narcissist and wants to think like, oh, like, dude, like, you know what I mean? Like, how can I make these people become better? But at the same time, he's like kind of just fucking them over. I don't know. The Akali Raft experiment received fierce criticism, but for Genevieve, it was a highly satisfactory job. He believed he found the new man who was free from all fateful territorial ambitions and all aggressive or sadistic impulses. He considered his experiment made an important contribution to human coexistence, and since it led to the, this important conclusion, basically, that the origin of violence is not biological, but cultural. Basically, this dude like thinks that he figured out the solution to just end all human anger and you know what i mean like just people being able to coexist and he's like oh it's because of our cultural differences like dude no shit <laughs> you know what i mean like i don't know bro like when i first read this i'm like yeah i don't know are you the first do you really think you're the first person to try to prove this or anything like i, I don't know maybe he is but also dude like you kind of like set these people up to do terrible things you wanted them to do horrible things to each other so up next is the facial expressions experiment in 1924, Carney Landis, a psychology graduate at the University of Minnesota, developed an experiment to determine whether different emotions create different facial expressions specific to that emotion. Basically, if you're sad, you make a very specific sad face. If you're mad, you make any, like specific faces for specific emotions. The aim of this experiment was to see if all people have common expression when feeling disgust, shock, joy, and so on. Most of the participants in the experiment were students, they were taken to a lab and their faces were painted with black lines in order to study the movements of their facial muscles. They were then exposed to a variety of stimuli designed to create a strong reaction. And we're going to get into these reactions or this stimuli in a second because some of these are a little messed up. As each person reacted, they were then photographed by Landis. The subjects were made to smell ammonia, to look at pornography, and to put their hands in a bucket of frogs. But the controversy around this study was the final part of the test. Like I said, the final part of this test or experiment was the most controversial part. And for that, participants were shown a live rat and were given instructions to behead it. Now, while all the participants were actually repelled by the idea, one third of the participants ended up doing it. The situation was made worse by the fact that most of the students had no idea how to perform this operation in a humane manner and the animals were forced to experience great suffering. Basically, this was just animal abuse at, at its core, you know what I mean? Like, you just hand a bunch of kids or, well, yeah, kids, they're all like university students, you know what I mean? 20, however old you are in college, whatever. Anyways, handing them like probably scalpels and just telling them to behead this rat, like, Think any of these kids have any idea to do that i know in high school we dice or middle school i think we actually dissected what like a frog and maybe even like a cow eye or something like that but i think i remember any of that at this point not at all now for the one third of the participants who refused to perform the decapitation landis would actually pick up the knife and cut the animals heads off for them so they're just picking it up themselves you know what i mean picking up the slack saying like oh you're not gonna do it all right bet let me do it then and basically the consequences of the study were actually more important for their evidence that people are willing to do almost anything when asked in a situation like this. The study did not prove that humans have a common set of unique facial expressions. Basically, they didn't even prove the thing that they were setting out to prove at first, um, or I guess it did prove that everybody just has a different reaction to anything. Like, I don't know what they were really expecting. Like, did they expect every single person when they get sad or anything to just like, you know what I mean? or like happy you just like throw up a smile like I, I don't know i don't know what they were expecting with this but they didn't get it so this was like a failed experiment all around and they just had a bunch of people torture these animals so l all around big l for this person uh landis trash person uh, and we're moving on
Up next is Operation Midnight Climax. Operation Midnight Climax was an operation carried out by the CIA as a sub-project of the Project MK Ultra, the mind control research program that began in the 1950s. Now, I do plan on doing a giant video of just everything that includes MK Ultra uh, at some point, but for now, I'm just gonna give you guys like a quick little summary, and then I'll break down everything in that one big video. It was initially established in 1954 by Sidney Godley and placed under the direction of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in Boston, Massachusetts. With the federal narcotics agent and CIA consultant, Dr. Sidney Godley was a chemist who was the chief of the chemical division of the technical services staff of the CIA. And under the Cold War and fears of the Soviet Union and China, Godley felt inspired to investigate the methods of mind control. Operation Midnight Climax was established in order to study the effects of LSD on non-consenting individuals. Prostitutes on the CIA payroll were instructed to lure clients back to the safe houses where they ended up drugging them with a wide range of substances including LSD and monitored them behind a one-way glass. Which is honestly some weirdo shit to me cause like, I don't know bro, like I, I'm just picturing like four or five guys watching whatever's going on with this prostitute and this drugged up, basically John, um, on the other side of this glass. Like that is just a weird situation to me. The prostitutes were instructed in the use of postcoital questioning to investigate whether the victims could be convinced to involuntarily reveal secrets. The victims were sometimes fed subliminal messages in attempts to induce them to basically do involuntary actions, including criminal activities such as robbery, assault, and assassination, which is weird. I don't know why you would want to try to do this, especially on just like random American civilians. Like, this is crazy. Many of the CIA operatives involved in the experiments voluntarily indulged in the drugs and prostitutes for recreational purposes. So basically, they were getting busy. They were, if you, trust me, once I make this long video, you're gonna understand. These people in the CIA office were off it. They were all taking acid. They were all taking drugs. They were, they were having sex with prostitutes. Like they were doing wild stuff back then. Um, yeah, we're gonna get into that later on because I have a full video for that. All right, and up last was the UCLA schizophrenia experiments, but I decided this video is probably already going to be long enough. Dude, I've been stuttering ever since the first entry, and I think I'm just going to make a complete separate video on that because there is a good amount of information. So be on the lookout for that. Also be on the lookout for the MK Ultra video. Um, I got a bunch of other stuff dropping soon. I got like four or five videos backlogged right now, so... You guys will be seeing a bunch of stuff, but if you got this far, make sure you guys like, comment, anything that you got questions on or anything that you want to see in the future. Um, subscribe, do all the YouTube stuff that they like, just so, you know what I mean? Helps support me at the end of the day and I appreciate it. But other than that, stay safe, stay dangerous, get laid. Um, don't sign up for any of these psychological experiments. I think that is a key thing to know just going over this entire series. Don't sign up for any of these because most of these are messed up and have the big probability of messing you up for life too. So anyways, stay safe. This is